Now the serving gifts would be any gift that you would serve. So today we're going to look at giving, the gift of helps, and the gift of mercy. All right, so these are important gifts. So a lot of times these gifts kind of take the backstage because these are not prominent gifts. When you talk about the gifts of the Spirit, like I said, many people want to focus on the tongues or the gift of healing, the gift of miracles or the gift of signs and wonders. But many times you forget that these are also gifts of the Holy Spirit. God gives it to them. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it says, He gives each gift to whom He pleases according to His will. All right. So giving is the first thing we're going to look at. Romans chapter 12, verse 8 says, If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving give generously giving is God's nature God loved the world so much that he gave God gives and so we are also it's a commandment we are also commanded to give Luke 638 Jesus said give and it'll be given back to you it's not if you want to give it's give and it'll be given back to you good measure they will pour into your lap a good measure pressed down shaking together and running over Giving could be done in different ways. You could give your time. You could give your resources. Sometimes, you know, people donate clothing. Some, sometimes people donate their talent. You know, you may be a good cameraman or you may be a good driver or you may be a good cook. We could use people like that in the body of Christ. All right? Because the preacher gets hungry, so we need a good cook. Okay? So giving. Let's talk about giving financially. The biblical principle usually is give one-tenth. We've heard that. It's called tithing. A minimum is kind of set by one or ten percent to understand like this it's not about how much of my money that I'm giving to God it's more like how much of God's money that he's letting me have because nothing that I have is on my own everything that I have comes from God it's like my child coming and asking me give me some money I want to buy you a birthday gift you we've all done that to our parents right that's how it is. God gives us the ability to go to work. God gives us the money, ability to earn. And from that, we're just saying, thank you, Lord. If you love somebody, you give to them. You don't hesitate to spend on them. And so how much it is, a basic is 10%. Now you may say 10%, that's a, that the tithing is an Old Testament concept. It's from the law. If you actually look at it, it actually goes beyond before. It started even before the law. During the law, it was actually more than 10%. It was about 30% or so because the Levites took some of that and other, there were other needs as well. Tithing began even before that. Abraham tithed. Abraham is kind of where our story starts. Abraham tithed to a king called Melchizedek. Some of you may have heard of this. Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Abraham meets with his king called Melchizedek, and that story is mentioned in Hebrews. It's also in the book of Genesis chapter 14. Abraham knew God, but we, we do not know where Melchizedek came from, but it says here in verse 2, Abraham apportioned a tenth of all the spoils, was the first of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness and also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Now, this could be a parallel to Jesus Christ. Now, this was not Jesus Christ. Like I said, many times in the Old Testament, we could see a theophany where Jesus appears himself, like in the burning, in the fire with, with the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He looked like Jesus. We could say this was, this was not one. This was actually a king. But here we see that Abraham gives one-tenth of what he earned or what he made, the spoils, and the king in return blesses him. Now, this is what you would call the spiritual law of giving. God said in Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, or let's go with verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house and test me now in this. The only place in the Bible where God says test me. Remember when Satan came to Jesus, Jesus said you shall not test the Lord your God. That's in the Old Testament as well. We don't go around testing God. I'm going to jump off of this cliff and see if God could catch me. I'm going to try and drink a poisonous, something poisonous and see if God will save my life. That's suicide in a way. That's foolishness as well okay test me now in this God says give one tenth and I will bless you back now this was the Old Testament when we don't give to God in verse 8 it says will a man rob God yet you are robbing me so we are taking away from what we are to give to God when we don't tithe these are the basics of giving 
These are the basics of giving. How have we robbed you, people say, in tithes and offerings? Bring the tithe into the house so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, as the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Jesus said the same thing in Luke 6.38. Give and they will pour it back, a measure. It will overflow. When we give to God, God gives back. So now, is that a reason to actually give? Do I give because I want something in return? That's selfish. You know? If I buy you a gift only so that you could buy me a better gift, that's, that's cheap, man. We give because we love God. So today, the gift of giving is a supernatural gift that God gives. People who have the gift of giving will give above and beyond to God, to the body of Christ. They will give above and beyond what they have or what they could, uh, what, what they make. Look at Romans chapter 12. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us has exercised them accordingly. If prophesy, prophecy according to, pro, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, or in other words, simplicity. Don't make a big fuss about giving. A lot of times we see this on TV or uh, when people are asking for money, they will, they will make a big, if you send me your gift, I will send you a t-shirt or I'll send you five books and a DVD or I'll come to your house. I'll keep you in my prayer closet. I don't know where the prayer closet thing comes from. I, if you want to give, give. God will bless you. That's between you and him. He said he'll bless you. Give. Yesterday we, would, we did some outreaches. Volunteers came with us. Whether they gave financially or not, they gave their time. They gave three hours of their day to come with us. We went and hung out with widows and blind people. God will bless them. When you give, God blesses you back. How? He knows. He's going to bless you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I think that's the New King James. In the NASB it says, a pour out onto your lap, a good measure, overflowing. That's how God gives. When we give to God, it says here, he who gives... Let him give liberally in a simple form. Let's look at some examples of it and then I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about giving simply to God, okay? Examples in the New Testament of our giving. We saw Barnabas and last week we mentioned a phrase, gift cluster. One person may not just, just have one spiritual gift, one uh, gift of the Holy Spirit. They may have more than one. Barnabas, we study that he has the gift of exhortation or encouragement. Now he also says in... Um, Acts chapter 4, Barnabas sold a piece of land. What was happening was, as the church was growing, people were getting persecuted. Christianity was being suppressed. And so Barnabas saw a need and he had a land because he was a son of encouragement or Josephus or Joseph as he's called in, before he was called Barnabas. He sells the piece of land and he brings, he gives. Now Joseph a Levite of Cyprian birth, verse 36 owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He had a gift cluster of giving and of exhortation. A lot of times we'll see is many of the serving gifts, they'll go well with other gifts. They'll partner with other gifts and that's how they're a blessing to the body of Christ. In the very next chapter, we see a story of a couple, Ananias and Sapphira. They did not have the gift of giving, but they pretended like they did or they acted like they did. He kept back some of the price for himself and his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. And we know the story. Peter says, what, what has happened that you would lie to the Holy Spirit? The man drops dead. They go bury him. A few hours later, his wife comes and says the exact same lie. They did not have the gift of giving, but they pretended like they did or they acted like they did. So we get to be careful as well. Don't overdo it. <laughs> Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. In Acts 11, there's a famine that breaks out all across Judea. And it says here, the disciples sent a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. They, select, they raised funds and they sent it through Paul and Barnabas. Okay? And then also in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about it in chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 2. For I know how eager you were to help. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. 
So now Paul is saying, you guys made a pledge. Many times you see that. Make a pledge. Make a pledge that you're going to give me $100, 100 rupees every month. If you got $100, give it. God bless you. Make a pledge. But a lot of times when you do a pledge, you start feeling guilty by the end of the month. Oh, man, I got to pay the bill. I got to pay the cell phone bill. I got to pay the house rent. I also got to pay this minister, this, this church. I got to give this money because they made a pledge. Making a pledge sometimes could be tricky. So these guys made a pledge and they, did not, they were not able to meet the pledge. And so Paul's kind of gently reminding them. Hey, remember you were eager to give and other people are seeing that you were eager to give. So uh, when I come by, I'm going to send some people over and maybe you could give. So I thought you could send, uh, that I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. Now, why wasn't the Corinthian church, they made a pledge, but why weren't they? Sometimes you're eager when you watch people on TV asking for money and you're ready to give. But then later on, you come to your senses and like, what did I just do? You know what I'm saying? So these people are eager to give, but they did not give. If you read 1 Corinthians, this is 2 Corinthians. If you read 1 Corinthians, you can see why. There were so many problems in the church. That's why Paul is writing the letter. There was immorality, there was pride, there was misuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So Paul's writing, uh, first of all, to, to sort those things out. And in the next letter, he's reminding them of this. Many times when you are not spiritually sound, your giving goes down. A lot of times people don't give their time or, or finances or their talents to God because their spiritual level gets low. So that's also a way we could see. Remember, fruit and gifts needs to be balanced. And also in the same chapter, Paul talks about this in verse 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. We saw earlier that when you give, give generously. If you want a big harvest, you have a field, an acre, 10 acres, sow generously. If you just put one seed, you're not going to get a bumper harvest from that. So he's talking about giving and he says, you got to give generously. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Nobody should give because they're feeling guilty. Nobody should give because they're feeling guilty. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You don't want to give out of compulsion. I don't want to twist your arm to say, I don't want to make you feel guilty. You're wearing nice clothes, but there are children who do not have clothes. So send your clothing to these. Give if God tells you to give. Not grudgingly, not with pain, it's a sacrifice, not under compulsion. Give because you want to give. And you know the part where it says God loves a cheerful giver. In the Greek, it actually means God loves someone who gives with hilarity. Someone who's laughing out loud, LOL. See, God doesn't need our money. Okay? God doesn't need our money. He's, the heavens are his, the earth is his, everything is his. We give because we love God. So the gift of giving, people who have the gift of giving, they will give generously. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, When you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that you may be honored by men. If you want to make a big show about how much you gave, there's no point in giving. If I'm going to put a chart here next week when you guys come, last week's offering, so-and-so gave this much, the next person gave this much, and this person, she just walked up to the offering and she went and sat back down. She didn't. That's not why we do it. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a race to see how much you give. You give because you love. Remember that widow? When she gave, she gave everything she had. It was only two coins, two might. And Jesus said she gave out of the, everything that she had. The other guy gave a portion of what he had. But this lady gave everything that she had. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees you what is done in secret will reward you. God is watching. If you have the gift of giving, if you don't, don't try. Like I said, don't twist your arm backwards. If you have the gift of giving, give. God will bless you back for it. He will reward you in secret. Amen? The gift of mercy... Romans chapter 12, verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, mercy is what we express when we're led by God to be compassionate in our attitudes, words, and actions towards others. 
as we're going through this, this study, people may come to your mind or your, you, your own personality may come to your mind thinking, I have that gift. Any of these gifts that we're studying. Or you may know somebody who has that gift or somebody in the past. See, it's more than a feeling or sympathy that we have towards somebody. It is love in action. It's love enacted. See, love, they say, is a verb. Which means if you say that you love somebody, or if Jesus said that he loves you, he showed it in action. He came down to this earth. He carried your sin. He showed his love in action. If you say that you have the gift of mercy and you don't do anything about it, you don't really have the gift of mercy. You know? I could tell you this, a personal uh, example. When I was growing up, I did not have the gift of mercy. I didn't. Around 2004, I remember this. I was in London. We were doing a uh, Christmas outreach right outside Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, you've seen it. If you've been there, you've seen it or you've seen it on TV. It's massive. The queen lives there. But right outside the palace, there was a homeless man. Or as we would call in India, a beggar, homeless guy. He was spreading out his cardboard sheet to lie down. As he was getting ready to lie down, the police came and they were like, hey, you can't lie down. Here's the queen's palace. And I was standing far off looking at this and my mind said, what makes this guy different from the people who are living inside the palace? Aren't we all created in God's image? Didn't God spend as much time creating this guy that he created that person as well? Just because she's born in a royal line or the prince and his family, they're born in a royal line. What makes them so different? It started there and ever since that, that vision, I came back to India and I saw a guy sitting on the bridge right by the, the head post office, there's that bridge there. I saw a guy sitting there and it was raining and there was no, nobody to do anything for him. And I remember sitting in the car saying, God, I want to do something for these guys. I want to do something for these people. And slowly, the gifts started growing in my heart. Gifts started growing in my heart. And that's how you end up with something like kindness charities. And we're still doing something really small. We want to do something so much bigger. Right? When God puts that gift in your heart, you cannot not do something. You have the gift of mercy. You're going to step out. Matthew West, this guy's got a gift of mercy, I think, in the, in the words that he sings. He, he wrote the song. You may have heard it. It's called Do Something. He says, well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist at heaven and I said, God, why don't you do something? And God replies back, he says, yeah, I did. I created you. I'm so tired of talking about how we're God's hands and feet, but it's easier to say than to be living like angels of apathy who tell ourselves, it's all right, somebody else will do something. And God all the time says, but I created you. And the, and the chorus, he says, if not us, then who? If not me and you, then who? Right now. Why wait till tomorrow? Right now is the time. Where we see an end to this pain, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. That's the gift of mercy. You can't just stand still. You can't just sit still. It's like, you got to do something. Let's look at some characteristics of the people with the gift of mercy. They have a friendship that is very deep and loyal. And sometimes it's to a fault, really. They can get offended if you talk about a certain somebody that they have a deep friendship with. They can get really offended and they could cause a lot of hurt. Uh, they take it very personally. The people with a gift of mercy, they're very good friends. They empathize. They have the empathy for people who are hurting. When they see hurting people, they want to relate to them. They want to talk to them. People with a gift of mercy, they may make decisions based on other people's benefits. They have a tendency to attract people who are in distress. Think of someone like Mother Teresa. People would come to her when you see those pictures or those videos or you read stories about her. That, that's, that's how they are. A lot of times those kind of people who are, who ha you know those kind of people with a gift of mercy. And these people come and they, and they have time and time. Like, aren't you getting tired? of ministering to these people? Aren't you getting tired? Don't you want to go home? But they give, they give, they give to the last drop. Amen? See, the person, like I said, having the gift of mercy, they could balance other people's gifts out. Let me give you a biblical example. Peter and John. Peter was more of the outspoken, stand up, and remember the first message that he preached, he said, this Jesus whom you crucified. That was his message. And people were cut to the heart, and they were saved. He was always paired with John. 
Now, if you know John, John was a disciple whom Jesus loved. He was always the one sitting next to Jesus. Can I sit at the right hand of Jesus? He was leaning his head on Jesus' shoulder. He was always close to John. Peter and John, they were a team. They went to the temple together. They, were, they went to Samaria together. Peter and John. Peter was kind of like the outspoken guy. John was more of the same message. Peter says, this is Jesus whom you crucified. People were saved. Uh, John's message was, God is love. And in him there is love. No greater love has a man than this. John used the word love more than anybody else in the scripture, in the New Testament. He had the gift of mercy. Jesus looked at him and said, take care of my mother. He didn't look at Peter. He looked at John and said, take care of my mother. You know what I'm saying? Mercy. Peter and John, so they go together. A lot of times people with the gift of mercy will pair up with another person. Or they may have other, other gift clusters as well. They have the ability to sense genuine love and express it like John. Mercy is a champion of the lowly, poor, exploited. The list goes on. Let's look at a Jesus example, okay? Like I said, I don't want to use a Jesus example too many times because every gift, every fruit, we can show, see it in Jesus. He's God. So Jesus, in uh, Matthew chapter 20, he's leaving Jericho and there were two blind men, right? And they're crying out to Jesus. And as they're crying out, they said, son of David, have mercy on us. Have, they didn't say, come and heal us, Jesus. They said, have mercy on us. And the people told them to be quiet, and they shouted out even louder. Son of man, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stops, he turns, and he asks them, what do you want, want me to do? And they said, we need to be healed. It's interesting to see that these guys associated mercy with action. So when you have the gift of mercy, you show it in action. Jesus showed it in action, touches these guys' eyes, they get healed. Receive your sight. The gift, it's a practical gift. It's a gift of active service. We are all called to be merciful. Matthew 25, 40, Jesus said, Whatever you do for the le one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you've done it to me. So the next time you help somebody, when you show mercy to somebody, think of it, what if this was Jesus? Now there are some drawbacks to the gift of mercy. Someone with the gift of mercy may not always make a good counselor. Because you may be a counselor and you have the gift of mercy, you start sympathizing with the pain. You may come in, you may talk to me about how you have financial problems in your house. And instead of counseling you, I start feeling sorry for you. So now at that point, the gift of counseling is useless. Uh, the one with the gift of mercy very seldom make good, strong leaders. Now it doesn't, doesn't mean that the people with the gift of mercy cannot be good, strong leaders, okay? Because they may have other gift clusters that they're good at, which is a blessing to other people as well. Because they are so merciful, many times they may fail to be firm in certain decisions that they have to make, which may end up being detrimental to their spiritual walk or to the spiritual walk of the other people. They may lean on emotions versus reason. Instead of thinking about what they need to do, they may lean on that. Now, I also want to finish talking about the gift of mercy with a warning. Gift of uh, mercy, because you're merciful and compassionate, the opposite sex, people of the opposite sex may be attracted to the gift of mercy that's in you rather than to the person. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's a, ca the, the, a guy, there's a guy with a gift of mercy. And a lady is suffering. So the gift of mercy wants to help the lady in pain. So he ends up, let's say this guy is a pastor. So he ends up ministering to that lady out of the mercy that's in his heart. Now this lady, she may misunderstand the gift of mercy in, in him. You know what I'm saying? Is that making sense? Or vice versa. A female leader, she may have mercy, the gift of mercy, and she may find a man who's in pain, and she may feel sorry for him. She may have the gift of mercy or compassion for him. And he may think, this girl's into me. So you need to be careful how it works. Right? So gift of mercy is an amazing gift to have. We need more people like that in the body of Christ. There are so many people that are suffering. Jesus was a great example of that. John, the apostle, was a great example of that. The gift of helps, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, prophets, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. So helps is considered as one of the gifts of God. It is a spiritual gift. To be able to help out someone, especially in a church setting, it's a spiritual gift. It's a God-given gift. 
Now, don't use that as an excuse not for helping somebody. You see somebody in need, I say, hey, can you uh, stack these chairs up? Our service is over. Sorry, pastor, I don't have the gift of helps. I will pray deliverance over you, drive the devil out. I'll be like, Paul, come at you with a whip. Uh, no, that's not an excuse. Or oh, you see somebody suffering on the road, and you're like, ah, oh, I would love to help you, but I don't have the gift of helps. No, we're all commanded to help. We're all commanded to be like Jesus, okay? We help. Look at uh, Romans 12, 7. If your gift is serving, serve them well. So, or help. If you're going to help somebody, do it well. The Greek word in, that we use for helps here literally means to relieve someone of their pain, to participate, to support, to be assisting other people with compassion and with grace. If you're going to help somebody with a grudge, there's no point in doing it. Yeah, fine, I'll help you today. Come on. That's not a help. That's a grudge. Okay? See, the gift of helps is, is a, um, you need to, you cannot have the gift of helps by yourself. If I have the gift of helps, I need to have somebody to help. You know? So if there's nobody to help, then that gift is kind of, it may become dormant. So the gift of helps is a ministry. We cannot look, it, look at it as anything else. This is not a very outwardly gift, the gift of helps. Now the gift of teaching or preaching or evangelizing, people see the man with a gift up front, a gift of prophecy. People see the person. Whereas the gift of helps is usually in the backstage. People don't really see them. They're behind, behind the scene. You know? And uh, many of those people don't also want to be recognized. They're like, it's okay if my name's not mentioned in the credits. I'm okay. That's the kind of uh, people they are. It's not a very popular gift. When there's a problem in the body of Christ, you know, we ta started talking about the cells in the body and stuff. If you have a cut, all the other cells, they come together and they try to stop the blood. They form a clot, a scab is formed, a pus is released. All that happens, that's what the gift of helps is. It's kind of the dirty work. Many times people don't want to do it. But we need people like that in the church. We need people like that in the body of Christ. That's what a deacon means. We saw that last week. A deacon pretty much means, a diaconia, pretty much means to serve. To be a servant, to be a slave. It's a practical ministry. Practical ministry. Look at James chapter 2, verse 15. If a brother or a sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? I have the gift of speech. That's not really a gift. Everybody's born with it. Okay? So I'm going to bless this person. You can have the gift of exhortation to tell somebody, but you need to accompany that with the gift of giving, the gift of helps. So if you see somebody in need, do something about it. But I don't have any resources to help this person in need. Get your friends together. Collect some funds. Go do something. It's time for us to do something. Amen? So that's what the message, you can call this message that today if you want. Do something. When Christians, Christianity started, the church started growing. Remember the first message Peter preached, 3,000 people. The next message, 5,000 men. And then if you had the women and the children, probably about 25,000. A mega church. The first church was too big. Now, the bigger the church gets, the more problems we have. I know. The bigger the church gets, the more problems we had. And so in Acts chapter 6, we see there's a first problem in the church. There were some Greek-speaking people, Hellenistic Jews, who got saved. And now their widows were being neglected in the serving of the food. And so what they do is the apostles, they get together in verse 2, and they said, it's not good for us to neglect the teaching and the preaching, so let's choose seven men to take care of the serving. Let's choose seven people with the gift of helps to come and step in this place. So they choose Philip and Stephen, and the list goes on. Verse 3, it says, they choose godly men of good reputation, full of the Spirit. Anytime you see a gift mentioned, you see that word, full of the Spirit. Full of the Spirit. So this is a gift given by God. Philip was one of them. Stephen was one of them. We know the story of Stephen. He got killed uh, next chapter, but even still he preached such a powerful message before he died. He saw a vision of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 it says, And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. The church was growing, 
because the gift of helps was present. Many churches die because there is no gift of helps. I've seen people who come to church and they stop coming to church because nobody was there to exercise the gift of helps to them. There were many people who helped Paul. Paul never traveled alone. Paul always had a posse with him. He always had people with him. For instance, he had Luke who always traveled with him, a doctor. That's how he wrote Acts and all the events that Paul, God did through Paul, right? So look at this. In Acts 13, verse 5, it says, John Mark was Paul's helper. Mark was the guy who wrote the book of Mark. And we also saw that Mark separated ways from Paul because of Barnabas and Paul having a misunderstanding in chapter 15. But if you look at 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11, pick up Mark or John Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for service. Timothy and Erastus, they ministered to Paul, Acts chapter 19, verse 21, 22. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Ephroditus, a young me your messenger, apostle, and minister to my need. So the job of these guys was just to make sure that Paul was doing okay. Some people misuse this gift. Again, with any gift of the Holy Spirit, you could misuse it. Some people do misuse this gift, take it for granted. That happens all the time. But Paul, I think, had a balanced approach. So these are some of the guys who helped Paul in different stages of life. And in Romans chapter 16, this whole chapter is a big thank you note. I commend to you Sister Phoebe, who is a servant. That's what it says. Which means deaconess, diaconia, servant, slave. She was not preaching. She was not leading worship. She was not up front. But she was the servant, though she was called a deacon. Today, the term deacon is kind of misunderstood. When you say someone's a deacon in a church, it means they're kind of the assistant pastor level. That's not how it was with her, which is at Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. She was a servant. She was serving, but still receive her like you would receive a saint. And that you help her in whatever she may need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. Paul goes on to write the rest of the chapter. He thanks 26 different people in this chapter. A bunch of names that we cannot pronounce. But he's saying these are the people who are serving. These are people who are helping. The body of Christ needs to be balanced. If one cell, if one part of the body, there's an excess amount of cell growth, it could end up becoming cancerous. Right? It could end up becoming cancerous. So if one, in, in, a, in a church body, if only one gift is exalted, Let's say the gift of prophecy. If only that is every Sunday you come, you're like waiting for that lady to prophesy. If only the gift of prophecy is exalted and the gift of helps and the gift of serving, the gift of giving, the gift of teaching, the gift of preaching, the gift of miracles, the gift of uh, uh, mercy, all of that is neglected. That one could get cancerous. Everybody starts focusing on that one person and it could become imbalanced. It become dangerous to the body of Christ. Everybody is needed. The gift of helps is given to those people who are willing to lend a helping hand. They don't mind doing the mundane, disgraceful things. If you have the gift of helps and you come and tell me, oh, no, let me go clean the bathroom, it's kind of dirty. I know you have the gift of helps. If I have to come and say, hey man, can you clean the bathroom? I'll buy you biryani later. That's not gift of helps, that's bribe. You know what I'm saying? So if you have the gift of helps, you naturally start saying, I want to do something about it. Let's, let's fix it up. Mundane, disgraceful things. Out of a spirit of humility and grace. That's also there. You can't do it grudgingly. Ah, pastor made me clean the toilet. They have been given the unique ability to identify those who are struggling. People who are struggling, people with a gift of helps, they will see them and they'll want to do something. They'll want to do something about those people. That's what the, the care team is about. They move towards those in spiritual need as well. With a kind word, understanding, compassionate demeanor. They have a unique gift to speak scriptural wisdom. So, word of wisdom is being clustered in this as well. Romans chapter 12 verse 12 says, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Every gift that we have is meant for the edification of the body of Christ. Your hand helps you in a certain way. Your liver, your pancreas, your gallbladder, and a bunch of other things that's inside your body that we don't know about or you learned in school and you forgot. It's all there. All those billions of cells, those nerve endings, they're all there to help you be a better person. Same way, the body of Christ, 
the church body, every gift is important. Every gift is needed. We're different members, but we all complement each other. So my prayer is that in this church, we have a balance of all the gifts. I may, I may have the gift of teaching, and so may you. And if God's given you that gift, I want you to get up here and teach one day. Don't bottle that gift up. Okay, don't suppress that gift because it may be taken away from you. If you got the gift of giving, give. If you got the gift of serving, serve. If you don't have that gift, if you just want to figure out what, God's get, what God got for you, ask Him and He's going to show you. Today, the gifts that we saw, these are all about practical helps. Giving and serving and mercy and helps. It's all about doing something. Like that song said, if not us, then who? If we don't go, then who's going to go? We see a need. We go and fill. God, we thank you so much for teaching us today about the serving gifts. God, I pray that if there's anybody here who's got the gift of giving or the gift of help or the gift of mercy, that you will start the fire in their heart, God, so they'll be able to step out and do something about it. God, and if they're wanting to find a place to get plugged into, I pray that you will show them where to get plugged into. You will open doors for them. You will give them opportunities to give, to serve, to help, God, so that they can be a blessing to others. We thank you, Lord. God, even now, bless the offering that we're giving. As people are giving, I pray that you'll give back to them as your word promised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.